Hi everyone, thanks so much for coming to my presentation. My name is Kryn Jorgensen and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Geneva and also a visiting researcher at the German Electron Synchrotron, DESI. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about part of my thesis work, which is a microtomography study of some melt inclusions from Coli Albani. Now, Coli Albani is a volcano that is in central Italy. It is mafic and alkaline, and it is quite close to Rome. It's about 30 kilometers away, and you can see here in the margins of this pinky purple kind of material. This is one of Coli Albani's ignimbrites, and the deposits are actually in the city of Rome. So as you can see from here, Coli Albani has a, a few eruptions, at least, that uh, spanned quite a large distance, giving it a few eruptions with VEI, so a volcanic explosivity index, of up to seven. And now typically when we think of large volume explosive eruptions, we think of ones with a bit of a higher silica content seen here with some volcanoes we all know and love. Now the idea here is that generally higher sil silica means a higher viscosity and therefore more explosive. But Coli Albani has a low silica content. In addition to it, it's also alkaline, which also will reduce viscosity. So this poses a really interesting question of how do you get this this magma with a really low viscosity to erupt large volumes in an explosive manner. Now this is the question that I'm really trying to answer with my thesis, and one of the ways that I've been investigating this is by looking at the volatile content of the melt inclusions. Now, just to give a little review, one idea for melt inclusion entrapment is that we have our crystal here, let's say a clinoproxy, that's in equilibrium with this reddish magma. Now, when it moves to a different magma, let's say this yellowish kind of one, it can enter into disequilibrium and therefore resorb. And this resorption will call these, cause these irregularities on the crystal surface. Now, these irregularities mean that when the, the crystal eventually starts to crystallize again, there'll be these, these pockets which melt can get trapped in. So these are our melt inclusions that we're seeing here. Now, these melt occlusions can then come up to the surface, perhaps after some, some additional crystallization, but as you can see here, there's some extra things that got added to these melt occlusions. Now, these are vapor bubbles. Vapor bubbles are, well, they're bubbles of vapor, so oftentimes it's a CO2 or H2O, and there's kind of two, two main ideas of how you can trap these vapor bubbles. One is, is pre-entrapment, so you trap melt occlusion that has already exolved gases in it, or the exolution of these, these vapors come after the trapment of the melt inclusion. And this can happen perhaps by contraction or just going into conditions that are no longer suitable to have exolved liquids. A particularly important thing is to look at these, these melt vapor bubbles because they can often host large amounts of volatiles. There's a study by Aposito 2011 which reports up to 64 weight percent of the total CO2 is in these vapor bubbles. So of course it's really important to consider this. Now for my melt inclusions from Coli Albani, I decided that a way to get a really good estimate of, of these vapor bubbles is, of course, to get a good estimate of the volume, which there's no better way to get volume than doing 3D scans. So I traveled to DESI to get some 3D microtomography scans of my melt inclusions. Here you can see one of the 3D renderings of the clinoperoxene crystals that I measured at the synchrotron. I also measured leucites, and these are the two main phenocrystic phases from Coli Albani. I know this is a really quick video, so I'll just let it finish and then we'll run through it again and I'll pause at different points. Okay, so as I said, this is one of my clinoperoxenes and you can see here, these are the different ortho slices. So this is really what, what creates the image. It's a stack of about a thousand uh, or so of these, these slices. Uh, and clearly you can see there's several melt inclusions. Uh, in this light purple and this darker purple color that you're seeing here, these are the vapor bubbles. So clearly in these melt inclusions, there's quite a few vapor bubbles. Now, if you're curious as to what the resolution for these scans are, this one, the resolution is half a micron. So each of these pixels that you see is half a micron, which I think is pretty, pretty darn good. So... What I really started to find when I was starting to segment and look at these melt inclusions is that uh, there were 
different types of melt inclusions. Now today we're just going to talk about the glassy melt inclusions. I also have some microcrystalline melt inclusions, but for the purpose of today we'll just talk about glassy ones. So of course there was these, these regular glassy melt inclusions that didn't have any vapor bubbles in them, which uh, is makes everyone's life the most easiest. Then there's the classic uh, with a single vapor bubble, with I, which I've called G, G1. And then there was this other type, which I hadn't really thought of or encountered that much in the literature, which I'm calling GM, which is a melt inclusion with multiple vapor bubbles on the sides of it. And, and almost always, when you have multiple vapor bubbles, you only get them on the margins, on the edges of these vapor bubbles. And but and a really interesting thing that I found out is that you can get all three types of melt inclusions in a single crystal. So you can see here in figure A, this little red one, this would be G, so it has no vapor bubble. These two just have one, and then this, this larger one has two vapor bubbles. And it's not only just with two vapor bubbles, as you can see here in B, we also have a melt inclusion that has several vapor bubbles in it. So this posed a really interesting question for me. How can you get these variations of vapor bubbles, of, of types of melt inclusions and in their vapor bubbles in the same crystal? Why is this happening and what can this really tell us? So I've kind of broken it down into two main thoughts that I have at this moment. So one, this is potentially magma control. Maybe this is different magmas with different volatile contents, um, and then the, the volatiles are, are going into the melt inclusion and exolving in, in the melt inclusion in different ways. Or perhaps it's it's just one one magma and we're just seeing the volatile exolution pathway. Because of course you would think that the, the two main volatile phases that generally melt inclusions have, CO2 and H2O, these are going to exolve at different points and they also behave in different ways. So, so perhaps it's a little bit controlled that way. Maybe though, on the other side, it's just diffusion controlled. So this means that after these vapor bubbles have exolved, we have to consider how any limits that they have to coalescence. So, so potentially this could be size limitations, maybe time and temperature limitations, whether or not these melt inclusions can reach each other and then overcome any pressures to coalesce. So how can we determine which of these is, is really controlling um, the distribution of our different types of melt inclusions? Now this, now this is a big question and one that I'll be trying to answer over the course of my PhD. But I thought today I'd share with you some of my ideas and then a little bit of my data. So if it is indeed magma controlled and we have different magmas, I should be able to see this in different zoning. Different melt inclusion types should be in different zones. Now I have a, a large set of 3D data, so this is a really wonderful way to take a look at this as well. Now, if I have different volatile exolution pathways or just magma with different volatiles, I should be able to see that as well by looking at the volatile contents. So by using Raman and Sims to, to get the volatile content of these melt inclusions, or even the, the volatile content of the different vapor bubble types. Now, if it's more diffusion controlled, there should be some, some limitations on this, perhaps time or, or temperature limitations, which we might be able to better understand via some diffusion modeling. But if it's size limited, there should be difference in the volume distribution. And I have several melt inclusions that have been segmented specifically for their volume. So let's take a look at that now. So here you can see this is uh, just clinoperoxines and it's a suite of about 450 melt inclusions. On our x-axis we have a log logarithmic value of the total melt inclusion volume in uh, millimeters cubed. So this is, this is the melt inclusion including the vapor bubble. On our y-axis we have a logarithmic of the total vapor bubble volume. So this is total vapor bubble volume because if the, there's multiple uh, vapor bubbles they've been summed together. So just starting off, if we look at orange, our glassy melt inclusions with no vapor bubbles, there doesn't seem to be much of a control on the size. Um, they span most of the range, perhaps with a few less at these larger volumes. But what's really interesting is if we consider the, the other two. So glassy melt inclusions with single vapor bubble and our teal seem to span most of the range, but seem to be more heavily in this smaller range. And when we get to larger melt inclusions, that's when we start to get 
the melt inclusions with multiple vapor bubbles. So there seems to be some sort of size threshold of about a certain size, that's when we start getting our multiple vapor bubbles. So perhaps there is some sort of diffusion control on this, but it's not the only thing. It's not a hard and fast line of, of past this, then you get multiple vapor bubbles. So this is a really interesting first estimate. And I still have many crystals to segment, so I, I'm really quite curious to see how this turns out when I finish segmenting the rest of my melt inclusions. Um, I should also note that these gray lines here, this is our lines of constant ratios between our vapor bubble volume and the melt inclusion volume. So this is an interesting thing to note because if we are getting vapor bubbles solely from differential contraction between the melt inclusion and, and the host phase, you would think that this would be constant, that this ratio would be constant. But clearly we're not seeing it fall on any of these lines. There doesn't seem to be a, a very distinct linear dependency. So what does this all really mean in terms of Kolyabani? I mean, I'm studying this volcano, so there has to be some sort of, of reason why this matters for it. So if it is indeed diffusion controlled, this gives us time constraints. And if we combine these time constraints with some geobarometry, then we can model for a scent rate. And this can really help understand, maybe this is the key for why we have a mafic alkaline volcano having these large volume explosions. And, or, if it's magma controlled, if we combine this with geobarometry, then we have volatile exolution pathways. And this can tell us where boiling is really occurring. And this is also something that could be really helpful in understanding why we're getting this, this explosive behavior from Coli Albani. So clearly I have, you know, lots of questions unanswered and a lot more work ahead of me, but uh, it was really a joy to share this work with you guys today. Um, I'm really open to questions, comments, and suggestions from anyone. I have a live session on April 28th between 9 to 10.30. Um, but you can also, of course, email me. Um, I hope you guys all enjoyed. Thank you so much for watching and taking the time. Uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference and have a great day.